Hello, so I've spoken about lots of different cameras on this channel now, and today I'm talking about the Canon 5D Mark III, one of my all-time favourites. I'm going to talk about kind of my experience of using it over the last eight years, uh, show you some of the pictures I've taken with it, and talk about some of the good things about it, some of the bad things about it, and whether I think it's still relevant in 2021. Someone the other day was asking me to recommend a good camera for them to look for second hand that would be able to help them improve their photography. And so my mind went instantly to one of these. And I started looking on eBay and you can get a real bargain. You know, five or six hundred pounds buys a really nice example of one of these these days. And if, if for a bit less money, you can get a more battered one with higher shutter count. You know, I found one with, a, I think, 350,000 shutter actuations on it for about 300 quid and it was just battered with all the paint coming off. To be honest, this one has done probably nearly that amount of shutter actuations. I checked it about two years ago and I think it had done 250,000 shutter clicks then. But to be honest, nothing has ever gone wrong with this camera at all. It's just worked perfectly and I've shot so many different assignments all over the world in really bizarre circumstances, in the dust in Africa, to being on speedboats and shooting cruise ships, to um, going into all kinds of different circumstances with it, and it's never missed a beat. It's probably been the most reliable camera that I have ever owned, and some of my most favourite assignments and best pictures have been taken with this camera, so it's very dear to my heart. And the fact that it's so reliable is really important to me. Now, I have moved on. I now shoot the Canon 5D Mark IV, and I'm now looking into the R range, the mirrorless range, and so and other cameras as well. I'm always interested in new technology. But when I look back on this, I do think it was a bit of a sweet spot in the time of Canon DSLRs. You know, I've been a Canon user since 1991, I think I bought my first one, which was a Canon A1, then I had a T90, then I moved into the EOS range with an EOS 1, EOS 1N, EOS 3, and then the, we went digital, so all of the digital range until the Canon 5D range, 5D Mark 1, Mark 2, and Mark 3. So there is about 20 years of evolution of design with this camera, and that really shows when you use it, that although it's kind of a lot of people will think of it as a bit of a dinosaur, and it kind of is a bit of a dinosaur now, it's kind of a bit of a classic dinosaur. It is 22 megapixels and I've always said that I think that that sort of 20-ish megapixels is a bit of a sweet spot for cameras. It means you've got enough information in the file to do pretty much whatever you want with it without it clogging up your computer and your hard drives and memory cards with the size of the files. And it's quite a forgiving size as well. As soon as you go up into the higher megapixels it really shows if your lenses aren't up to scratch and if your technique isn't up to scratch, and if your lighting isn't up to scratch, all of those things tend to show a little bit more. Now, in terms of video, I don't really want to talk about video today because if video is your thing, then it kind of changes the parameter. But we're just going to talk about this camera for a, from a photography point of view. And I think if I've got it right, most of my viewers are into photography rather than video. But, you know, let me know if you've got any other thoughts. So, 
this versus the Canon 5D Mark IV, you know, the 5D Mark IV is 30 megapixels versus the 22 of this. I don't, I use them side by side all of the time and I don't really see a difference in the files. There's probably a stop or two extra ISO ability in the Canon 5D Mark IV over this camera, but certainly, you know, the, the, the specs say that this will go up to 100,000 ISO, I think, and it will. But I don't use it beyond kind of 32, 6400 ish is kind of my cutoff point because I need my files to all be guaranteed to be usable by clients. I can't have a picture that I like the noise in it, for example, because, you know, sometimes that's true, but I need it to be contained within a, a usable set of parameters. And so if extreme high ISO is your thing, there are better cameras. But for me, 6400 is like quite high, you know, and you can achieve really great things with, with that. This camera shoots at six frames a second, I believe. Which is not too shabby for an old dinosaur. There are faster cameras, obviously, but six frames a second is not too shabby. Still sounds great, doesn't it? Listen to that. Even after all these years and these shutter clicks, it still sounds like a healthy young whippersnapper. There are some incredible lenses that you can get for this camera. The Canon full frame lens range is, is extremely wide. You can get pretty much anything that you want from Canon or from many of the other camera manufacturers. And there are some absolute bargains to be had. As, as people have moved into the world of mirrorless, um, there are some real bargains to be had for the, the Canon EOS range. I said I wasn't going to talk about video, but it does shoot 1080p at 25 frames per second. And it's really rather nice. There's nothing wrong at all with that video footage. It's just that there are some cameras with more advanced settings that have been released since this camera. But I've shot multiple video projects on this camera and they've been fine. It's just that it doesn't have quite as much advanced settings as some of the newer cameras. The screen on the back is not brilliant. The um, You can use it in live view, but it's not as good as, it's not touch screen, it's not flippable. It's just really rather basic. And that, although that's one of the problems, it's also one of the advantages of this camera that in some ways, this was the last of the basic DSLRs. It's heavy, it's well designed, it's super tough, super strong, pretty simplistic in many ways, although the this is also one of the first cameras that had a pretty advanced autofocus system. So though it's not as advanced as some of the newer cameras with these crazy eye following bits of technology, you can actually customize the AF settings on here quite well. It's just not quite as advanced as the newer ones. But that kind of is almost like the sweet spot in many ways, because it's a bit of a dinosaur but it has some pretty cool technology going on, but it's still quite simplistic at the same time. And the, all of those things add up to something that I believe make this a rather an incredible classic camera. And the fact that you can buy it at the price point you can now, second hand, I kind of wonder whether a lot of photographers out there, you know, would benefit from using a camera like this over some of the more complicated mirrorless cameras that are being launched into the market now, because ultimately the picture is everything. And in photography, there are only a few settings that really make that much of a difference. You need to get your pictures sharp, and this has an autofocus system that will ensure that you get many of your pictures sharp. If you're not getting sharp pictures with this camera, it's because you're doing something fundamentally wrong. And a newer bit of technology will help, but it won't get over the problem that you just need to learn to use the tool that you've got. In terms of exposure, this has the most perfect set of dials at the top, which you can use for your shutter speed, and a ring at the back, which you can use for your aperture. And they're fully customizable to go either way. And all of the other controls just fit to your hand where you want them. It's super customizable, so you can turn it into what you want. And it doesn't have an EVF. Now to a lot of people that will be a problem because EVFs mirrorless are the new rage. They're smaller and you can see what's going on through the viewfinder. But personally, I have a bit of a battle with this because I can see all of the advantages of an EVF, but personally I just like looking at real life, a reflected real optical image through the viewfinder. and. Even though EVFs are getting better and better and better, and I'm kind of look, seeing the advantage of that and considering the EVFs for moving into the world of EVFs for my work with the R range of cameras, but there is still this beauty about looking at the actual real life optical image 
reflected through the lens and the you know the connection with the subject and the timing that you can use for expressions and that you can use for timing your moments and your the way that you take your pictures is really quite important and you know I grew up using DSLR technology looking at looking at real images reflected onto <laughs> reflected through the viewfinder or onto screens as in focusing screens on large format cameras or medium format cameras and so I've got a bit of a connection with that which I think maybe some other photographers don't have. Now in terms of its kind of basic overall use I think that it's probably about as good a camera as you could find at the moment for the money if you've only got that much money. I'd be really interested to hear your opinions on what you would advise somebody to buy as a first camera if they're not probably a first camera first serious camera as in they're coming from a basic DSLR or a compact camera and they're wanting to get into the kind of advanced photography skill where they're starting to learn to use lenses and understand settings and understand exposure and maybe go on to try and kind of really raise their level of photography up higher. I'd be interested to hear what you would think would be the best camera specifically around the kind of obtainable price point because some of these cameras and lenses setups at the moment you know you've got to have a vast amount of money to get in and even shooting professionally that's a big investment to to make um, especially during the current climate but you know there's a there's a there's a lovely sweet spot around this camera because you could probably go out and spend less than a thousand pounds and get yourself one hell of a setup that would probably be able to cover pretty much anything i want to talk about dynamic range because this camera is really good. I don't think it's inferior in any way to the Canon 5D Mark IV. I've pushed and pulled these files around, pulled up the shadows and pulled down the highlights and always got presentable results. And I think that leads on to another thing, which is trust. One of the reasons why this is probably my, you know, one of my favorite cameras from the last two decades is just trust. I've been able to trust it. I've taken it all over the world. I've taken it into the most extraordinary, difficult, circumstances with all kinds of weather problems and environmental issues and it's always just worked. I don't think I've ever had a problem and that makes me feel really 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 comfortable as a professional photographer to know that I can trust this thing not to let me down. It always comes up with the picture when I need it to take a picture and the picture is always presentable and I can do enough in post-production to make it exactly how I like and that kind of means a lot to me as a professional. It's kind of my livelihood and it's important. So not only is it a very capable camera, it's a very reliable camera. I hope this has been of some use to you. Please subscribe and send me a comment about your thoughts about this video and about what cameras you're using or have used in the past or think might be a great camera to recommend for somebody. Um, thank you for watching. Goodbye.